Alrighty folks, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Vance Kronobis and I'll be your technical host for today's webinar. Uh, before we get started here, I just want to do one final audio check to make sure that we are coming in loud and clear. So if, uh, for those of you that have just recently joined us, welcome. Uh, and for those of you that have already been here, this might be a little bit of a repeated process. But if you could just again go to the person icon located at the top of your screen, so the person raising their hand, and just select the raise hand status so that way I can see that we are coming in loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. So before we get started, I'm just going to go through the, uh, the portal's features here so that way uh, we all get familiar with it. So to the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see a chat pod. This is where we're going to have all of the questions fielded. So if you do have a question during this webinar, please feel free to type in your question over there. Uh, this will be a listen-only webinar. So please use the chat pod to type in any of your questions. To the top of your chat pod, you have the presentation files. So for today's presentation, uh, we actually have the PDF slide deck version um, available for you to download if you wanted to follow along uh, offline. Uh, obviously, in the center of your screen, you do have the webinar content. So that's where you want to keep all of your eyes. And finally, to the left-hand side is the attendees pod. So this is where you can actually see everyone that's attending this conference, or sorry, this webinar nationally. Uh, now I'm going to actually turn it over to uh, Jennifer Johnson, and she's going to be giving us the presentation introduction. Uh, whenever you're ready, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vance, and thank you everyone for taking time out of their day um, for this webinar. Um, I just want to start off with an introduction of our presenters. Um, I'd like to introduce Gina McNeil and John Palashnuk, our guest presenters for today. And Gina has over 20 years of professional experience in the municipal recreation and marketing field, including seven years of corporate experience in customer engagement and loyalty programs for unique niche global brands. Recently, Gina was the project lead for the full implementation of Perfect Mind with the municipality of Halton Hill and currently with Perfect Mind as a new relationship manager based out of Ontario, Gina acts as the linchpin and champion on the municipal side with a full 360 degree view of all aspects of the Perfect Mind Recreation Management Solutions business. Um, next up, we have John Palashnuk, and he has experience in all facets of the parks and recreation business from product development to sales, and from delivery to support. He has been actively engaged in consulting projects and enterprise-wide software implementation across North America, Australia, and New Zealand. As a director of implementation at Perfect Mind, John has led his team to the highest billable utilization average and customer NPS scores year over year while effectively building and managing a highly rated professional services and consulting team responsible for services to over 500 customers. So I think we've got some good information and knowledge base here um, for our webinar here today. So again, welcome Gina and John. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to Gina who will run through our agenda. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the type of things that we're going to uh, review today with respect to a brand new way of doing business is to identify priority outcomes, um, beginning with the end in mind, um, going from where you are to where you want to be, and looking at uh, current state versus ideal future state, um, RFP best practices, where you would package all of the information you've gathered together to find the right partner, um, the possibilities and fit, pit, pitfalls that will come across um, throughout the course of your project, and that's about collaboration and discovery. Um, it's all about perspective, looking at the old versus the new and which way is the best way to go. Um, and the continuous evolution of change, basically, yay, you're live, now what? What happens from this point? So those are the type of things that we will be looking at um, in this overarching presentation. So the objective is basically to identify priority considerations and outcomes for your success. And your success will result in the success 
of whichever supplier you choose um, to, to go with. So the in intent of the uh, presentation is to provide a big picture overview um, of the key ideas to consider in your planning stages for a new recreation management solution. This would include offering key insights and learning about going from the way it's always been to a different way of doing business using a cloud-based software. So for those that are coming into this um, project thinking it will be a replacement for your existing system, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're setting yourself up for failure and you will be sadly disappointed. Um, you can't fit a square peg into a round hole. And that's what you'll be trying to do if your intent is to try and fit what you've always done into a brand new way of doing business. So keep that in mind. Um, the best and most successful approach to take when embarking on this new adventure is to view this as a positive opportunity to do things differently. You're looking at bigger and better and outside the box with functionality you may have never considered before. So these are all key things. Um, that you need to have in, in the back of your mind coming into um, this project. So begin with the end in mind. What does that mean? Well, the key here is to focus on the big picture and identify um, what the successful outcome will be while taking the necessary time and uh, preparation to achieve the ultimate end result. You have to understand that this is not a sprint where you try to and race to the end as fast as you can to get it completed. It really is more um, along the lines of a marathon. And I'm not sure, you know, to be quite honest, if any of you are runners, and if you're not, you'll have to indulge me uh, for a minute. But typically when preparing for a marathon, there's a lot of preparation and planning necessary. And there are actually stages to the process. And in reality, there's, not a lot of, there's a lot of synergies and parallels to planning for a marathon versus implementing a new recreation management solution. I mean, if you think about it, nobody just gets up one day and goes and runs 42.2K. And if you're that skilled that you can do it, you're my hero. Um, I don't know what to say more than that. You know, typically there's a trigger that creates the desire to achieve and do something different that you've never done. Um, and in this instant of a marathon, you know, your trigger could be, I need to get healthier, more fit, and into shape. That would be your big picture. The end goal, you would decide, okay, I'm going to run a marathon and choose a target event date, and then, you know, to compete in your first marathon. Between that stage, you're looking at planning. There's base training you have to do. Like, there, you have to lead up to a 5K, and then do your first 10K train further for a half marathon until you get to the main event. And during the course of that, from beginning to end, there's always uh, injury management. You have to engage others as support along your journey. And at the end of the day, your outcome and the final goal is to, you know, finish your first ever marathon, be the fittest you've ever been, and, you know, have a benchmark for your future opportunities. The time, effort, and energy that needs to go into implementing a recreation management solution is no different than preparing for a marathon. So you're looking at setting the stage for a brand new way of doing business. That is your big picture. You're in a position now that some don't have a choice and some do have a choice and want more. The end goal is looking at you know, choosing a target date to go live. So you have to decide, okay, we have to do this. This is when we would like to do it for. Now you have all the planning stages in between. So from there, you have milestones, and that's part of the planning. You have to include planning, configuration, testing, training, and then, of course, from that, what is the bottom line? Across the board, you have risk management and constant communication that's necessary throughout the course of the entire project. But then the final outcome you want to look at is basically creating improved customer experiences that are true to the municipality, plus the positive impact that this will have on your business and your bottom line. And to be able to do all of that well, you need to put everything together into the optimal right team for your business. So in looking at that, one of the key things to understand is that this is a recreation-led project with IT and finance support. 
It's not an IT-led project. No one understands the recreation business better than those directly involved or with the vast knowledge and experience on the municipal rec side of the business. Those are the key people who should be the driver of this bus. And we will actually discuss these roles and responsibilities um, in a later slide. So identifying the, the key core team players, you're looking at the project lead. Um, ideally, depending on the size of your business, you should consider having two. And the reason I say that is um, for many reasons. If you're a larger municipality, there is a, a lot of work that has to go into this. It's not as simplistic as you may think. And as we go through um, the presentation to identify a lot of areas that are involved, you'll truly understand that. Secondly, whether it's a large or a small municipality, a lot of times some of the players after you go live um, end up moving to different departments. Um, they end up you know, going to new roles in other municipalities or they end up retiring. And you end up being stuck with not having a subject matter, matter expert still in your municipality. So consider that when you're looking at your project leads and your teams. Um, these individuals should have ample municipal recreation experience, and you should look internally or externally. With the internal, they have familiarity with the existing processes and procedures, and you know they know the business where they're at right now. Externally, um, you might want somebody who can bring a new perspective and a fresh approach to, to your business. Um, which approach you decide is dependent upon your leadership and the strategy and the vision for the department. Uh, really, how you move ahead is dependent on the type of things that you're looking for. You have to look at a project champion. Realistically, it should be a recreation management level person or higher and a key decision maker. There's nothing more frustrating than, than having to go around and circle over many layers and levels um, you know, to try to get decisions made or get things done. Um, it, it just depletes the purpose and it takes a lot of energy. And you're looking at a steering committee that there needs to be representation from areas of the business that will be impacted by this new change in some form or other. And typically it would definitely be the recreation department, but info services and IT as well as finance and HR. They're very instrumental and important in this process and you have to make sure that they're part of it. So the next few slides are just examples of the type of areas you need to flesh out and understand fully. They're not necessarily reflective of your current circumstance, and the information will vary on the size of your municipality and how you're using the existing system that you have and where you want to go in the future. So please keep that in mind um, with the next few slides. One of the first things you need to do is look at a problem statement. Now, I think to be quite honest, the problem statement identified here would probably fall across the board for those that are on the call. And basically, the existing software is no longer supported or does not meet our current needs, and it needs to be replaced with a more desired enhanced solution. So the type of things you want to look at is what's in scope. Determine all the things that need to be included in this project, the things that come at a cost of time and money. Out of scope, you know what? Is this project going to be specific to the recreation department only? Which would mean expansion to other town, city sections is considered out of scope? Or are you considering you know, including library facility and program bookings? And what about corporate POS? Think about all those type of questions to figure out what you want to do as the overarching problem statement. In looking at your team, um, truth, I recommend starting from the bottom up, not the top down. Uh, although directors and managers tend to have a fairly good picture of what goes on in their department, it's the frontline staff that truly have the pulse of the community and the best view and experience and understanding of customer, you know, their needs. So make sure that they are part of the process and you really listen and involve them as much as possible. Um, stakeholders. It's essential that you include representation and receive feedback from those that will have a touch point with the new system at some point in time and in some form or other. Um, consider a community survey on what customers would like to see at hand. Discussion groups with instructors and staff on what makes their lives a little bit easier. That type of thing. Look at all those um, when you're moving ahead when you're looking at this part. Knowing where you are. I mean, your end goal is to go live. What are the key deliverables you hope to get when all is said and done? 
And I know we have uh, a few identified here as examples, but you need to look at your municipality and identify one or two key priorities from each of the areas of recreation that will have an impact um, on your business. Um, in, in this instant, I mean, some of these could apply, some of these may not. Think about what's important to you. But in doing so, your community and participants are your number one focus. Please don't forget that begin with the end in mind. That is true intent, is implementing a new solution, is to you know, create an optimal customer experience for community first and foremost. Secondary is to make staff lives a little bit easier internally. But the end goal is your customer, and that's how you need to approach a new system, um, looking at the type of things you want to do in that respect. Then you have to look at where you want to go, the future state. I mean, you need to create an overview implementation plan. Um, you want to include a lot of key deliverables that will make your life easier. Pick one or two again and look at it. With your implementation plan, create an overview implementation plan that is reasonable and realistic, and it matches your ability to deliver on all the work that is necessary leading up to your intended go live date. And I say intended because if you don't have dedicated staff working solely on the project and they're only working off the sides of their desk, it potentially could push the end goal. If you don't take the necessary time to put into your business processes and align and streamline as much of the, the areas you can prior to configuration, you'll be going in configuring the system blind. And when testing starts, things may not work out the way you'd hoped. You may have to go back, start again, reconfigure, retest, and in most part, end up reviewing policies and procedures later down the line. And that too could potentially and you know push your end goal. If you don't have the right people to the table and invest the time into the testing phase, um, in all areas of your newly configured business before your end goal, not only could issues arise during go live, I guarantee they'll become known afterward. This is why risk, risk management and communication is essential for all stages. You want a full 360 view of all areas and what needs to be known and shared um, as necessary to make sure the project runs smoothly in all directions. Current state versus ideal state. This is truly what I would say the essence of planning. Um, it is the most essential component of everything that you're going to do leading up to the implementation of your software. And really, um, this is to gain a better understanding of what needs to be done. And the, you, you, this picture here is showing a, a variety of different sections of recreation department. This is just a overarching. Different municipalities have different um, titles, different sections, and that type of thing. Please know that this is just a, an overview. Um, but you have to understand that everyone plays a significant and valuable role in the success of the project, because each individual has a unique insight into past issues and future opportunities. You want to make sure you have all of those perspectives considered. At, this part is about creating a culture of connection to share ideas and concerns, contribute to one another's thinking, and warn groups early about potential risks. I mean, really, planning is the heart of success for final outcomes of the project and the most essential part of the entire process. It requires a thorough and necessary amount of time and understanding of the way everyone currently does business. And the reason I say that that way is, although you may think you have all of this singular process and procedure in place, I guarantee if you have multiple facilities um, within your community, you definitely have multiple different ways people are doing business because they've created shortcuts that um, you know suit their needs or the needs of that particular facility. You need to flesh that out a little bit further. Um, it provides opportunities for analysis and creating new improved business workflows for future ideal state um, circumstances. It, planning also sets the stage for process matching to enhance your existing and or identified improved processes with the opportunities afforded for the new recreation management system. So with the next set of slides that I'm going to walk you through, um, it's just an example of business process mapping. And I've chosen to be specific to programs. 
So please note the slides may come across as somewhat overwhelming. The intent isn't to read every little box and, and try to get a thorough understanding of what's in them and, and, and you know, try to compare them to your business. Really, the intent is to go bigger. Um, I just want to keep the points high level to give you an idea of the type of things you want to consider when walking through all stages. This is just a concept and I, you know, what it could look like. It's not necessarily reflective of your business. So the business process mapping, knowing your business inside and out. This component is essential and critical to the success of the project. You need to go through this exercise for all areas of your business. Although I've chosen programs to kind of do an overview, you also have to look at facilities, memberships, POS, marketing. What else that you have involved with your recreation department needs to be included in your business process mapping? <clears throat> You need to dig deep into every step involved to run your programs efficiently and effectively, considering every possible scenario to include in the workflow mapping, such as the examples you see here. I mean, what are the actions you take to plan a program? How and who sets up the system? What are all the things you do before registration day? What happens on registration day, including payment process? Now if they've paid for the service, what are the steps leading up to the start of program? And how do you prepare for the day participants arrive during the course of the session? And what type of follow-up is there afterwards? And in looking at this, don't forget things like registered programs and school par partnerships. Drop in or admissions that are free. Drop in admissions that are pay as you go. You got membership, subsidies, inclusion. There's just a whole slew of things that have to be included. And it's very essential that you take the time to have the conversations with all the people that are involved in all of those aspects. So the business process mapping um, for this area is like really you're looking at creating a process map of all steps involved in the planning and pre-work necessary to have all of your internal bookings secured prior to opening up the time slots for outside usage. So many municipalities typically um, have internal processes because their programs get priority over everybody else. So the things you need to think about here, and again, there's no need to review all the slides, you will have it afterwards, but think about your internal policies and procedures. Is there an internal allocation meeting? How far in advance you need to have your planning complete to book the facilities? What are the time frames and all the steps involved? What parts include manual processes and where does your current system or come into play? The next part is where you would create a process map of all the steps involved in the planning and pre-work necessary to have all of your information prepared for input into the brochure and leading up to registration. So it's your pre-prep. How far out do you need to start the planning process for a course? you know, considering things like what's your brochure timeline. Uh, most municipalities, that's the driver of when you have to have all your information in. What are the stages involved? Uh, that includes needs assessment, cost analysis, all the type of things that you have to throw into program planning. Um, what parts uh, are manual processes and where does the system come into play? Uh, you're looking at past reports, schedule rollovers, evaluations, program promotions. All of those things are part of the pre-prep. Think about all of those stages and what's involved. What is paper? What is not? Who does what? All of those things are essential and important in your planning. This is where you would create a process map of understanding all steps involved when registration payment is taken either on site or in person. Um, you know, this is a really big and in informative piece where you have to include your finance team as part of the process. This should cover everything from taking payment to all formats, um, you know, cash, check, credit, EFT, all the way to end of day reconciliation. Map out all of that information. What parts include manual processes and where does the system come into play? You've got registration forms, deposit slips, cash transfers from facilities. Um, all of these things and all of the steps that are included uh, during this time, you need to be able to map out and understand that better. 
This is where you would create a process map of all the steps involved that take place after the customer plays, uh, pays up to and including day of activity and the follow-up afterwards. This is essentially the customer experience part of your mapping. Um, how do you prepare for your classes? What part include manual processes and where does the system come into play? Think about your class list, inclusion and medical info, um, facility setup and maintenance, staff and instructor schedules, participant info. Do you have to send them out packages? Uh, is there details that they need to have prior to class? Um, attendance, evaluations, what do you do afterwards? Do you do evaluations during the course of the program? Um, do they go afterwards? Do you do them at all? Um, reports and file retention, what are the things that you do? And of course, with all of your preparation and planning, no matter what you do with programs, there's always complexities, exceptions, and considerations um, for each specific programming course. With that, um, basically the type of things you're looking at is pricing. Um, you know, no drop-in, tax included, 10 weeks. Condition, uh, you know, conditions of the client, is there age restrictions? Prerequisite, you know, is there paperwork required, like park use or waivers? Um, you know, pass and membership conditions, is there like discounts and, and subsidies? Um, and in this instant, I've highlighted um, cancellation and refund. As an example, um, you know, most programs have similar policies around cancellations and refunds. Some, you know, as an example, allow seven days before the course starts, but attach an admin fee um, that has to be paid. However, in the similar instance, um, in the case of summer camps, they're, you know, which are hugely popular and used for child care service, you may have a different policy for a two-week notice um, to make sure that you can fill the spots and you know, some don't have an admin fee if the spot is filled. These are things that you need to take into consideration in all aspects and look at each one of those with every particular program you have. This is a brief overview of what it might look like um, to process map the programs part of the business. Um, every municipality, you know, um, will have different pieces of the puzzle that will create a unique image and story of their current reality, which will really set the stage for the next part of the process. And this would be the start of creating your workflow maps for the ideal future state. This part is the benchmark of where configuration should begin. So everything that you've done at the beginning prior to this will set the stage and will assist you in how you want to input um, this new information or the information you have into the system. You need to, re like basically the intent is to create an improved way of doing business based on all the information you've gathered from the initial planning to the exercises. And you have to look at these completed documents and I highly recommend that you also share um, the business process mappings from each of your sections with the other sections to get a fulsome view of all parts. Um, I know that for some, it might be a rude awakening to understand all the stuff that the facility booking folks go through when it comes to internal or external bookings. It would be a, a, you know, a, a nice exercise for the facility side to understand everything that's involved in planning and preparation for a program. I mean, without the programs, you need the facilities and vice versa. You guys work hand in hand, and it's instrumental that you work closer together. So it's a good way to, to get a good overview of how the businesses truly interact and work together. So share your business process map. Um, with doing that, too, you need to basically look at all of the stuff you have and analyze it. You need to work through each map and challenge each step. Um, look at you know every section. Say you know what, why, who, why, where, why, when, why, how, why. It might have been the way you've always done it, but does it have to be that way? Can you make it easier? Can you streamline it a little bit? Like can you eliminate unnecessary work and combine steps and rearrange the steps and add new steps just to make things more simplistic, efficient, and effective? And then you really have to consider reviewing your internal policies, procedures, and processes in advance. Streamline your fees, like having 200 fees. Do you really need 200 fees? Take a hard look at the way you currently do business. Simplify your membership. 
if you have 50 memberships that do all similar things and you just call them a different name, look at singularly looking at a, a new name that can combine these memberships. Consider that. Align age categories. Um, you know, some different, you know, different programs have different age categories, different type of facilities offer different programs for different ages, and, and they're not aligning well. Look at what the true age of a teen is. I mean, it's, it could be all over the place between 12 and 21, uh, 14 to 18. Consider that. Look at aligning all of your internal policies, procedures, and processes. Please understand that while you may have created what is an optimal vision for what you hope the system will do, you're still beholden to the actual capabilities of the system and may have to rework some areas to find a happy medium until such a time that new enhancements are introduced. I mean, the, these ideal future state business process maps will become your new current state, and they will be ever evolving, as will the system. And if you stay on top of them, it makes it so much easier down the line, heaven forbid, if something new has to change yet again. Many of these things we have discussed so far will play into the next part of the presentation, in which John will share his experience um, at this point in time. Hi. So I'm going to look at it from an RFP type perspective, meaning we obviously need to pick some new software. How do we go about that? So pre-selection process, implementation, change management, getting the stuff up and running, all of that is what we need to take a peek at. So what we want to do first is go to take a look at the pre-selection process. So, who will be involved? Do, we, do I need to know who first, or do I need to know how do I select somebody first? So let's take a look at how do I select somebody first. This, this is all organizational policy. Do I have to go to RFP? Do I have to, do, can I single source a vendor? Can I, uh, buy off an approved vendor list. You need to ask the questions internally. What do I have to do to get new software? And then once you know what your process is going to be or what you have to go through, then we can go and say, great, I have to go to RFP. Perfect. Who is going to be on my team? Who is going to help me create this RFP? I want Obviously, people from the business, I want people from the finance department, I want people from the IT department, I want people from the recreation department. All of those people combined will help me build an effective proposal so I can get the right solution. I have to ask questions. I think the biggest part of this that I've seen uh, be a downfall for people is that they don't ask enough questions and they make assumptions that, you know, the purchasing guy will help them or the purchasing guy will drive the, the process. They may drive the RFP side of the world, but they are not going to drive the, the software that you actually are trying to buy. So as you go through this and you've identified your team to help you get your, your RFP done, you also have to keep in mind a timeline. If you've asked the questions and you've said back from the organization says that their typical RFP timeline beginning to end is six months and you want to be live with software in eight, we're going to have to rethink those timelines. So again, you have to be realistic. If, you, if you're not realistic out of the gate, then you're going to, you're going to cause yourself stress in the project before the project even gets started. So let's look at when I'm building my RFP, what is what is it I'm trying to do? What am I what am I wanting? What do I need? Um, needs are business critical items. Uh, I, I need to buy some registration software. Well one of the critical needs would be that it does registration. Super important. So think of that. Um, as we go through, and when you're asking questions, uh, a need versus a want, you have to challenge your team. People will come by and say that they need it 
to do this. Well, is that something you do today? It could be something you don't do today, which is also okay, but if it's going to be critical, then it has to be really where you want to take your business in the future. You're going to have to decide is it something you live and die for in an RFP. Does any vendor even have that crazy functionality that you're asking for? Have to keep it into, into perspective. And when you're building things that you're trying to uh, accomplish uh, through buying software, you have to be, be careful uh, terminology. Is that a industry standard type terminology, i.e. a registration? Yeah, a registration for me would be an industry standard type of terminology. Um, don't use terminology that you might have used internally. Don't use terminology that maybe the current software you have uses to identify parts of it. Keep it kind of generic. Um, don't build multi-part questions. I would like it to do a registration and print a receipt and email the receipt and order pizza and tell the customer when their schedule is. In an RFP situation, if the vendor has a yes or no question, or pardon me, a yes or no response to that question, what do I say yes to? Or how do I say yes? How do I say no? You get accurate information behind you. You don't. I said yes. And you're fully expecting that my yes means that you're going to get all of those things that you just asked for. Well, you might get everything except for the ordering of pizza, right? So build an effective question. It's way easier to go backwards after you have to look back at your RFP to say, I asked this specific question, I asked this specific question, etc. Okay? Wants versus needs. Gina talked about challenging your business, taking your business forward. So be careful when you go to build your RFP, you want to think obviously about things in the future. Where do I want to take my business? Right? So if the software is is out there that can take your business and transform it or help you transform it, that's great. If it becomes a want versus a need is where it really becomes critical in your RFP to determine what type of a need is it. More on the scoring side, you could put your hopes and dreams in the RFP, and I think that's fine. I think that in your scoring metric on your own side, you have to identify what's a, what's a need and what's a want. So you get an accurate representation of, of whatever you're trying to buy. So now our RFP is successful and we have a vendor. See, that wasn't so hard. Okay, I need an implementation team. Who needs to be part of that? Well, I need to have, again, a cross-section of my organization, of my business represented here. I want front desk people. I want supervisors. I want managers. I do want people from the finance team and from the IT team involved. If they choose to opt out, well, then they've chosen that. But you need to invite them. You need to make this open. Um, the more people, the better, with a caveat that says, let's not go crazy, right? Um, how many people do you need to meet your timeline? Let's go back to the timeline we said. If it was realistic, then we could probably say, I need 10 people with these different time commitments over this period of time, eight months, six months, three months, whatever your size of your organization is, to meet my timeline. Should these people be fully dedicated? Some people will need to be fully dedicated. Nothing will destroy your timeline more than people doing three different jobs and being a part of your project, especially if they hold a critical part. Okay, as you are developing your team and you're going to uh, come up with how you're going to work together as a team, make sure you have a communications plan. Understand how you guys are going to interact. You may not all be in the same building. You might have different things pulling you apart, but you need a solid communication plan. This 
will tie people back together. And again, set the right expectation. I, if the time commitment has been laid out, that's your expectation. If you guys have uh, working teams that are going to meet twice a week, again, that's the expectation that's been set. People need to be able to be held accountable to that expectation. Change management is always a huge part of this, right? We're going to change. We've already decided we're changing as we're going, to, we've gone to buy some software. So life is going to change. How do we do that successfully? Well, again, communication is a huge part of that. But you have to have in the organization a champion. If you have a champion, they can help facilitate and get people that might be stuck, unstuck, so we can move our project forward, right? We always have the people that, that fear change and, and, you know, that's a natural reaction because it's the, it's the fear of the unknown. But we're going forward as a business, as an organization. We have to make these changes. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. You just have to get people bought into that. Okay, your core project team needs to embrace that change so that it's always a positive outlook. We're going to do some of the things that may be unknown and scary, but it will be okay. If you're working with a vendor that has got a great implementation process, that implementation process overlaid with your positive team approach you guys can move things forward, right? Don't get stuck up on one or two things or let one or two people hold your project back because they're unwilling to change, okay? The key stakeholders, um, again, just to reiterate, are the ones that are gonna support the change, help uh, make sure nobody gets stuck, make sure that we are, are gathering the correct requirements, um, again, challenging your business to say, let's stretch ourselves. We, we've, never, we've never done online registration before, but that's the way of the world. So what, what does that mean to us? How does that affect us? The change in that case is really shouldn't be too hard. Um, you know, everybody is doing online registration. You're, you're booking plane tickets online. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not that much of a stretch. So a little graphic here that, that, that shows how we want to help people um, work through the change or, or uh, you know, get unstuck as people can get along, or pardon me, get stuck in any of these different phases uh, of, our, of, our uh, of our timeline here. Um, the communication plan and getting team buy-in should take care of the first hurdle, if you will, um, unawareness. You have to be open. You have to communicate, right? Um, once the person's aware, then they don't understand necessarily um, what it means to them. It goes right hand in hand with understanding. What does this mean to me? I'm aware of the change. I don't know what it means to me. How is it going to affect my life, et cetera, et cetera. Once that person is then given the information and you know, maybe it, here's where your sponsors come in and say, great, you know what, you're not going to lose your job. We are going to be a better, bigger, more efficient department. You may have spent 80% of your time doing this function before. Now you're only going to spend 40% of your time doing that and give yourself, you know, 60% of your time to be able to better serve customers. I accept that. Great. So then I'm bought in to the commitment level. So this will take many different shapes and forms throughout your project, whether it's somebody that does has done this certain job or somebody that has owned a certain process that may not own that process again in the future in the new software world. You have to be very cognizant of how and what um, these changes are and how they will affect people. Um, it can it can. Creep up on people, and you won't even know it. Um, 
you know, they'll be the ones that were very hesitant to get involved and then uh, dig in when, you know, you, you want to change something that's really, really makes sense. Okay, we have, again, <laughs> more things that, that we, we, we need to make sure are all connected. So the arrows here really should say that all of these things are important and it's not that the IT team only comes in in phase three and then it's gone for the rest of the project. They'll be in the project in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, they may have more tasks, for instance, in the end than in the middle, right? Your recreation team, again, same thing. It's going to have more responsibilities, but their responsibilities will probably be fairly consistent throughout because they're going to have to own it when it's done. Gina said, this is not an IT project. This is a recreation project. At the end of it, you guys are going to have to own it. Don't forget to bring the finance guys in. Most of the software out there is a registration, is a facility booking, is a membership sale, is a POS components to it. They all create financial. Nothing, uh, no quicker way to alienate finance guys is to tell them they're going to have a change two days before they actually have a change. So bring them in early, get them bought in, let them help you throughout this process. Way easier than trying to spring something on them at the end. So the perspective is changing, old versus the new. We used to do things this way. We're going to do things in a new way in the future. How do we get there? Well, from a straight technical part, taking away from the the business job function of doing a registration, we want to decide what are we going to do. We've got data in our old system. We have data in Excel sheets. We have, you know, cabinets full of registration forms. What are we going to do with those things? Do we want to talk about moving data from an older system into a newer system? How do we get existing contracts that we may have booked for field use for the next 12 months into the new system when they are still valid in the old system. Is it worth it to migrate some people data so that people feel that they are been taken care of, they existed in the old system and now they exist in the new system? Do we need to take our system that we're building and does it need to talk to anything else within our organization? Does it need to talk to the finance system? Well, we brought in the finance guys early, so we can ask them this question. How do you want to receive the financial data? Another item on that list would be a brochure export. So you guys probably create a guide of some sort now through uh, you know some sort of um, either you type one out or you take some extract of data from current system, you know, how do you, how is that going to look in the future? Do we want to, to download data out of software? Can the software download this data? What does single sign-on even mean? Well, there you go. Great questions to ask. Does it affect you guys? Does it pertain to you guys? Do you have lighting that's on sports fields at somebody's job? is to turn the lights on and the lights off. Maybe the new software you have does that automatically or sends data to the lighting system automatically. Things to, things to ask, right? What does it mean? What are the features? What are the benefits? Because we brought the IT guys in as well, hey, I'm going to need some new hardware here. It's in our, we budgeted for it because we thought, you know, these computers haven't been replaced forever. We needed new printers or scanners. So it's all part of the project. Maybe the city has got a, a new uh, internal wireless project going at the same time. Great. Let's get involved in that. Let's say, hey, can our application take advantage of that? 
is there a benefit for us? So any of those things are possible. The continuous evolution of change. Now you're live, now what? So we've had a wonderful project, we picked a vendor, we got it implemented, now what are we going to do? Don't stop. You have to keep moving forward to maximize your investment. You've just spent 30 grand, 100 grand, whatever, getting the new software in. New software requires maintenance. Just like a car, you buy a new car, you don't just drive it and put gas in it. You've got to take it to the dealership, get oil changed, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing here. We need to, again, now look ahead for the next 6, 8, 12 months once the software is live. We're going to need to do staff training because we have staff turnover. Well, that makes sense. The software is going to make new changes and exciting releases. Well, how does that affect me? Who's going to manage that? We need to think about that. Right? I got a question. How do I do this in the software? Well, that's a call to support. How do we decide to handle that? Do I let every one of my staff call the support line? Or do I say, you know what? We're going to have an internal team of a couple of people. We're going to funnel those support requests through those people and then into support so that we build an internal knowledge base within our organization. Right? So that question now, next time it gets asked, it doesn't have to be a call to support. It can get answered internally. You have to think long term here. You have an investment. You're going to need to do some things to make sure that you're still happy and still making the best use of all of your time and money that you've put into this. So you have to think that you've got it implemented. We've, we're running. We're happy. We have extra questions, how do I get those answered, do I need to look at the software has made 10 releases, we need to do some reconfiguration training. What's the cost? How is the company going to help me keep my investment and keep me happy? So basically we're saying once you're live, it's not over. It keeps going. Um, and just to interject here, John, um, this component, the after go live, um, from my experience so far, is the one area that has not received a lot of attention from um, many municipalities who are now scrambling to try to figure out it after the fact. So I highly recommend that as important as the business process mapping on the front end is, this is equally as important on the back end. And it needs a lot of attention and a lot of understanding and actually a lot of resources or a few resources that are dedicated in that respect. So what does success look like um, at the end of your project? Well, here's some key examples with respect to the schedule. Um, you know what? You meet the go live deadline. Um, I'm sending out positive vibes. That, that, that happens easily. Um, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Um, for scope, all the stars align to meet all the necessary requirements you asked for. Um, the UAT testing was fulsome and complete. Um, budget, you meet your target goals and you avoid any scope creep. Team satisfaction, was everybody involved in the process, adequately supported and fully trained? Customer satisfaction, um, the customers are internal and external. So you're talking IT, you're talking finance. You're talking your, your user groups at the end of the day, um, all stakeholders. The end product needs to meet their needs, and that is successful. And then the quality of the work. Did the supplier deliver on the RFP specifications? John talked about making your specifications realistic and, and, and you know, asking singular questions that are for yes or no. That's very important. And then timely ongoing support adjustment as required, the quality of the work. So these are all key factors. So the, basically, in summary, um, I truly hope that you've had, you know, found some value in this session and that you'll walk away with some key information to share um, with the rest of your team and that it will help you make the transition as smooth and seamless as possible. I mean, this really isn't about implementing a new system. It, it's truly about setting the direction for a new, more effective, efficient way of doing business. And this is something that everyone will feel they have you know, contributed to, to the success um, as a team.
Now okay. we open the Thank floor you. up for questions. Yeah, sounds good. So if anyone has a question, feel free to just pop it into the chat box um, to the side of your screen. We'll just have a few more minutes um, to answer any that you may have. And just a reminder uh, to complete the survey at the end of the webinar as well. It will take about one minute to do so. Uh -huh. Okay, we'll give everyone a few more seconds to get any questions in that they may have. Okay, we'll start off with one from Allison here. So is there a difference between how you do process mapping for facilities compared to what you reviewed with programs? Yes. Um, I chose programs to, to show because it's less complicated. Um, with respect to facilities, um, chances are many municipalities have more than one municipality, or sorry, one, more than one facility. So in essence, what you need to do is per, you know, combine groups instead of one overarching group to do the overall facility part. I recommend you kind of um, bring it down so that you're, you're doing the process map mapping specific to each facility, and then from there, bring it back up and, and compare the facility process mapping. And the reason I say that is um, many CSRs in, in different facilities, although they're supposed to do end of day reconciliation a certain way, or the way they take bookings, whether it's last minute ice and that type of thing, um, although there may be a policy or procedure that's out there in writing, in practice, it's not typically the way it happens. And each of the CSRs have found unique niche ways um, to basically do their business, and you need to bring it back up when you're bringing in a new system to be able to see that, align it, so that everybody is doing the same thing across the board, but also how you set up the system will function and make it easier for them when the new system is in play. So when it comes to facilities, um, it's, there's doing a lot more specific stuff for each facility and then bringing it up big picture um, is typically what you would do in that respect. And that's one of the reasons I didn't choose that as an example. It's, it's a lot more complicated. Awesome, thanks so much, Gina. And we'll just do one more question here um, from Dave, which is better? importing data from the old system or starting from scratch starting from scratch in the new system well i'm not sure that there is one solution or, or one option that outweighs the other i think there are pros and cons to each of them if you have really good client data in your current system then i think it would be worth taking it out and putting it in to the new system if your current collection of client data has a lot of duplicates and people have not really maintained the addresses and we don't have email addresses, for instance, then we might be better off to allow people to go online and create accounts for themselves. When you talk about um, data beyond sort of a tombstone data set, uh, you know, name, address, phone number, um, it really becomes uh, a, a challenge to say, yeah, it would be faster, but then you lose the ability to reconfigure and reprocess uh, or build new business processes to, to rent facilities. Is your, is your fee structure different? Is it effective? The program names you had before, did you even like them? You know, have they been the same for 25 years? Do they need to be refreshed? So there were other things to consider besides just the, the data and just being quick. Again, probably the best use of data is to bring over um, people data. Um, it makes people feel good that they're already in the new system and you get a quick buy-in from that. But again, you have to look at your data to see what condition it is in. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so that's all the time we've got for questions today. Um, while the survey is up, if you have any more questions, 
Um, for John or Gina, feel free to click yes if you'd like to talk more to them or on, on the subject. Um, other than that, thank you so much for joining us for planning considerations for selecting a recreation management software with us today. Uh, everyone really appreciates John and Gina sharing um, their expertise with us. And I'd also like to send out a big thank you and shout out to Pro Ontario for having us today as well. Uh, again, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Feel free just to complete the short survey. Signing off. See you next thank time. Thank you everyone.